do, I would like to pass it on to uh, Claire Aslan, uh, who is the co-director of the Landscape Conservation Initiative. She's also an associate or assistant professor at the uh, School of Earth and Sustainability at Northern Arizona University. Um, and so, I, Claire, I think I'll turn it over to you and um, we can dive in. I, you can do some um, uh, preliminary uh, introductions, et cetera, because we'll probably have a few more people join us, although it looks like we have almost 20 on the line. So that's great. Great. Thank you so much, Sander. Hello, everyone. This is Claire Aslan, and I'm here with the rest of the Sonoran Fire Adapt Project team at Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff. We very much appreciate you joining us today for this webinar. Um, we've been really looking forward to this opportunity and have been communicating with many of you for about three and a half years now over the course of this project, which is pretty exciting. Um, just to, let's see here kind of explain a little bit about how the day is going to run. Um, we're going to start by, by presenting what the goals are that we have for this webinar in, in particular. We're gonna talk a little bit about the need for Fire Adapt, some of the background information, um, some of which we've already discussed with some of you over the past three and a half years, but try to bring everybody up to speed. We're going to explain the methods that this particular project um, has involved and also discuss some of our preliminary analysis results. We will have time for questions and feedback at the end. And we're very much looking forward to incorporating that feedback as we continue to refine these analyses. So we'll refer a few times during the course of the webinar to the next steps that this project has laid out for it. I did want to start off by introducing our team. This is the team that we have represented today, the Fire Adapt team that has been working on bringing you the results that we're going to deliver in the next couple of hours. So I'm there on the left, I'm Claire Aslan at NAU. And for the purpose of this project, my focal area is social ecological systems. I'm also a community ecologist and have lived and worked in the Sonoran Desert off and on for the past 20 years. I had lived there for about seven years before coming up here to NAU. So I've worked with some of you in more of a strictly ecological context in the past, um, but this has been a project that has been a chance to link my, my dual interests in the social sciences and the ecological science world. We also have Dr. Manette Sander, who has been bringing us quantitative ecology for this project and has been responsible for a lot of the really innovative modeling that we're going to be producing today. We have Dr. Sarah Souther, who is a plant ecologist and has also been contributing high-level quantitative ecology to this project. Martha Sample is an environmental scientist and has been helping us um, along the way with a lot of the logistical development. Many of you have received emails from Martha or been in contact with her over the course of this project. Sasha Stortz is a social ecological systems expert who is not here with us today because she is on maternity leave, but she was deeply involved in this project all along. So again, many of you have had a chance to interact with her. Dr. Carrie Levine from Conservation Science Partners is a fire ecologist and brought some quantitative modeling as well to this project and has been working in particular with Manette and so ha has been responsible for a lot of our ecological models that have gone into this work. And Miranda Gray is a fire ecologist who did her master's work on the fire systems in the Sonoran Desert and provided a lot of the base baseline information that this project developed off of. So our ultimate goal for the Fire Adapt project is to produce maps of fire resilience that span the Sonoran Desert ecoregion and to offer those maps as a tool to managers that are faced with changing fuels and fire regimes. This particular webinar is a piece of that process. We are going to be delivering initial results during this webinar. And in three weeks, we have a workshop scheduled on June 20th in Tucson. Some of you that are on the line now are also signed up for the workshop and we're very excited to have you. There's still space if anybody else would like to sign up. And the idea with the workshop is that we are going to be able to get together in person to discuss the next iteration of these results and also to talk through next steps. That could be the next research project that we all agree is the, is the priority next step for the region or other directions that we could take this work, but also how we could better disseminate the results from this particular project and make sure that they get as wide 
um, an availability to those potential stakeholders that might use them as possible. And the sign-in for the workshop, the sign-up information is going to be put in the group chat box by Martha in the next couple of minutes. So today we're going to be talking about future fire dynamics across the Sonoran Desert, dynamics that we're really starting to be able to observe and also predict using downscaled climate models, vegetation ecology, fire connectivity models, and just our enhanced ability to predict these types of patterns. But it's true that these patterns are not just ecological. They're inherently socio-ecological, and they, they do result from an interaction between the ecological system and the social system. So this project, so the, the Sonoran Fire Adapt project, has aimed to quantify that relationship between the social side, between the management responses, and the ecological side of these fire patterns. It's possible then to model out possible future fire patterns incorporating management on the ground, but that type of modeling must consider how that management might change if fire or fuels change over time. And of course, trying to understand that requires some novel techniques and forces us to go beyond just the simple ecological modeling that we've been able to, to exploit over the last few years as it's developed. Our goal for today is that we are going to share the methodological approach we've used to try to link the ecological and social sides of future fire in the Sonoran. We're going to share ecological, social, and combined socio-ecological maps of fire resilience and adaptive capacity. We're also going to share some additional analysis results regarding some of the patterns of fire management that we have begun to see emerging in the Sonoran Desert Eco Region. We will have a couple of chances to answer some questions, and we're looking forward to receiving feedback and using that to refine our products. The next step, going beyond this particular webinar, so we are going to be incorporating the feedback and conversations from today into some final fire adapt resistance and adaptive capacity maps, highlighting resilient and vulnerable locations across the eco region. We will be discussing those maps further at the workshop and continuing to refine them. And then eventually we will be making those maps and products available for download online. And also of course, completing the report for the joint fire science program, as well as peer reviewed manuscripts and making both of those available for download. So we consider this to be our first results dissemination activity, but there are several more coming down the line and we hope to make this as broadly available and useful as possible. To get just a little bit um, further into the background that underlay this particular project, some of you are very familiar with the high precipitation event that happened in the winter of 2004 and 2005. It led to this really extreme biomass burst where non-native and native annual grasses grew at unprecedented rates across the Sonoran. That was followed immediately by an arid spring and summer. So all of this extra biomass dried out and we resulted in these unprecedented fire ignitions and acres burned in the year 2005. This was to the, the point that some land managers have reported to us that their locations on their lands that burned in 2005 still have not shown signs of recovery. And in the words of one of them, look like the surface of the moon now, 14 years later. So this is really something that's of concern. It's true that this has been 14 years. It does not happen every year. But we can look at some of the models and foresee that departure from historical fire patterns is more and more likely driven by weather departure from normal as well as increased invasion of non-native species. So those fires of 2005 were responsible for 89% of the total area that was burned between 1989 and 2010 in the Lower Sonoran. So out of that span of 21 years, um, that one particular year accounted for the large, large majority of all fires. This seems to imply that between that, with that combination of climate change and invasive species spread, it's possible to get these bursts of increased, flamm increased flammability of biomass, decreased native species populations, and the modeling that we are able to produce regarding both climate change and invasive species seems to suggest that this is likely going to be a new Sonoran fire pattern, where we end up with severe fire years at long intervals, maybe every 20 years, maybe more, more frequently. These would be driven by the weather, and there's this positive feedback relationship with non-native species. As we know, this is a non-fire adapted system, and so when we do have these events, it becomes difficult for the native ecosystem to recover. 
The possible consequence of this, of course, and the consequence that we want to avoid is ecosystem type transitions where we lose native Sonoran desert vegetation and it is replaced by grasslands and particularly grasslands that are dominated by non-native species. The grasses that are both native and non-native across the region are fire adapted. Some of the non-native grasses seem to spread particularly quickly and burn at particularly high um, uh, temperatures and therefore lead to extreme mortality among native species in the vegetative community. So changes in the dominant vegetation type could impact management objectives and activities. And that's really where we focused this particular project. We wanted to understand how managers are going to be impacted and also how they might be able to respond. In particular, it may be possible for managers that are able to respond efficiently to help boost resilience to fire by restoring disturbed sites that are at risk of site, state change, for example. It may be possible to evaluate socio-ecological resilience across the landscape and begin to work perhaps across boundaries with other managers to facilitate effective management. So there are potential responses, but it's also important to get a sense of where vulnerabilities lie. The primary questions that we were interested in addressing for this project were, first, at what point do fire and fuel patterns change enough that current management strategies are no longer able to meet objectives, whatever those objectives may be? So whatever objectives a particular landowner or land manager have, at what point are they unlikely to be able to meet those objectives? And then could those activities change? Perhaps they could retain the same objectives, but use some other form of response adapt their activities. On the other hand, at what point do fire and fuel patterns change enough that current objectives cannot be met regardless of the activity employed? And in that case, do the basic objectives change? So do we have to fundamentally change our goals for a particular location on the landscape? Briefly, I'm going to get into the framework of resilience that this particular project is built off of. Resilience is a term that you probably hear a lot. It kind of gets thrown around in terms of discussions of healthy ecosystems. But resilience has a particular meaning, and in fact a few meanings, <laughs> that's often used in the ecological literature and also the so sociological literature. So I want to be sure that we're all on the same page here. Typically, we think of resilience as the amount of disturbance a system can absorb before it transitions to a different type or state of a system. And resilient ecosystems would be those with the capacity to return to their original states following a large disturbance, such as a fire. Here in the bottom, we have um, drawn out for you the classic resilience diagram. This is adapted from some classic literature that's now 50 years old and is still being used quite a lot. Normally, this is drawn as this curving or wavy sort of series of hills and valleys, and that represents the state of any given system at any particular time. Ecologically, we might think of that as what's the vegetation type? What type of community do we have in that location? And there's this ball that rolls across that surface, and the ball is the system. So the system that we're particularly interested in. Maybe we're interested in the location within a particular jurisdiction. That's the system. And as it rolls across these hills and valleys, it may enter different states. So at one point, it might be native desert. At another point, it might be grassland. The concept with this particular diagram is that it takes a certain perturbation or disturbance to push that ball and raise it up and over the nearby hill <laughs> across a threshold and into a new state. When it's within a particular valley, it has a tendency to stay in that valley. It takes some force to move it out of that valley. But perturbations that are large enough or sustained enough can indeed move the ball and move it into a different state. So resilience itself is this concept of how likely that system is to retain its current state. In our case, we're interested in native Sonoran desert ecosystem. How likely is a particular jurisdiction to stay in that native Sonoran desert state? Resilience is often decomposed into two components and it's important to point these out because we do use each of these in the following presentation. First of all, resistance. And this is the concept that there's a tendency for that ball to remain in its current state in spite of the perturbations. So the fire may burn, but what remains there is native vegetation. The other concept is resilience, and this is the tendency to return to its current state 
after it's been dislodged via some sort of a perturbation. So in that case, perhaps the fire burns and eliminates the native vegetation, but how long does it take and how easily could that native vegetation come back? For this webinar, we define resilience as both of these. And in particular, we talk a lot about resistance being the ability to stay in your current state and adaptive capacity as the ability to adapt or return to the current state after some sort of a perturbation. So please note that throughout the webinar, we discuss both of these as important components of resilience. Our approach then is to model future fire risk across the landscape to identify locations where risk is of concern. We identify likely management responses for those systems and we identify locations where response success is either unlikely or uncertain. And through this, we're aiming to understand socio-ecological resilience in this system. And so you can see I overlaid a few words here to try to define the difference between basic ecological resilience and socio-ecological resilience. Here, the system is the management activities, that full set of activities that are occurring at any given location. The state would be the current management objectives. What is the goal? Is the goal at that location grazing? Is it conservation? Is it some form of recreation? Perhaps it's native species preservation. And meanwhile, this threshold that that ball might get up and over would be the likelihood of meeting current objectives. So if that ball is perturbed enough, if fire is able to move that ball enough that it overcomes that threshold, then it may be necessary to change the, the objectives of management at that particular location. And our modeling and our quantitative analysis have followed this framework. All right, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Manette Sander, who's going to describe some of the methods that we have approached in taking this framework and translating it on the ground within the system. Thank you. Hopefully everyone can hear me well. Um, so I'm actually going to build on uh, what Claire just introduced um, by showing you the general framework of the analysis before I go into the detailed methods for each of the components. Um, a lot of you have likely seen some version of this tree. It is exactly what Claire described and that resilience is made up of resistance and adaptive capacity and that there's this additional component of risk. And when you combine resilience with risk, you get a measure of vulnerability. So because this is a socio-ecological system, what we're doing is we are creating um, analyses or we're doing analyses of ecological resistance, but also social resistance, ecological adaptive capacity and social capacity, um, social adaptive capacity and ecological risk and social risk. And then for to get total socio-ecological risk, resistance and adaptive capacity, we're combining the ecological and social analyses. So to begin with, I'm going to start with ecological risk. These analyses were done by uh, Miranda Gray and others. Um, they focused on, or they modeled annual fire risk by focusing on how dynamic this system is in terms of fire and fuels on an interannual basis. And through these models of past fire, they found that higher values of maximum normalized difference vegetation index or NDVI of the fire year and the lag fire year um, are, were among the strongest predictor, predictors. And this graphic on the right is NDVI in four years and over the same spot on the landscape. And it shows both the variability in abundance of vegetation with 97 and 2005 having a higher abundance of vegetation in green and the locations that are greening up. So in this particular area in 1997, the southern parts of this region were greening up more in 2005, the northern parts were greening up. And using these models um, of past fire uh, to discover this driver and 
of NDVI and other drivers, um, they were able to successfully uh, model fire risk across the landscape. So this is a moder moderate fire risk scenario uh, for 1996, and the dots are large fires. And if you look, the dots correspond to areas where the model predicts high fire occurrence. And this is another demonstration of that, but for a high fire risk scenario in 2005, where there were many more fires and the models were able to successfully predict areas of high fire risk that matched where these large fires occurred. And so building upon these models that predicted past fires, um, Miranda and others used these same methods to predict annual fire risk into the future. And to model dynamic annual fire risk, they drew on a suite of predictors that either varied annually and could be forecasted into the future or were assumed to remain static through time and into the future. The dynamic variables are indicated with a red asterisk and they include year fire maximum NDVI, lag year maximum NDVI, total winter precipitation, winter mean daily minimum temperature, and fire season mean daily wind speed maximum temperature and humidity. The static variables included road density, distance to urban development, surface heat load index, topographic roughness, elevation aspect, and slope. To forecast these dynamic meteorological variables, they use the MACA downscaled climate data set, including output from 12 global climate models. And to forecast NDVI into the future, they use 32 years of historical precipitation and NDVI data to statistically relate cool season precipitation to annual maximum NDVI. The results of those predicted NDVI values versus the observed NDVI averaged over the entire study area are shown on the graph. So as you can see, there's really good matching between predicted and observed. So they could then use the MACA precip precipitation data and the fitted coefficients to forecast NDVI into the future. The response variable that they used was a binary response variable, 30 meter pixels that burned in a large fire or 30 meter, meter pixels that burned in a small fire. They created 10 uh, independent random draws from this binary response as training data sets and included the entire US Sonoran Desert region, not just our study area, so that they had more training data to draw from. And the colors in the map below indicate which of the 10 data sets the training data belong to. The red are large fires that the large fires 30 meter, meter pixels were drawn from, and the small samples were taken from a federal fire point occurrence data set. They used those 10 independent data sets and accompanying predictor variables to train 10 independent random forest models. For each of the 10 global climate models, the mean and standard deviation was derived from those 10 random forest models. The annualized estimate of fire risk was averaged over 10 data sets and 12 global climate models and includes uncertainty. That uncertainty being standard deviation of the random forest models means and standard deviation of the global climate model means. To predict and compare maximum risk at each 30 meter pixel, they forecasted annual climate and NDVI variables into the future for two time periods, 2015 to 2034 and 2035 to 2054. Obviously 2015 isn't the future anymore, um, but I'm still gonna refer to that time period as future fire. For three different time periods, uh, past 1950 to 2005 in these two future periods, they predicted annual fire risk and determined the maximum annual fire risk in each time period. They then compared historical maximum fire risk to future fire risk. So these maps at the bottom just show you uh, fire risk on the left, the uncertainty from the random forest models in the middle, and uncertainty from global climate models on the right. Before I get into um, the 
social fire risk models, I wanted to give you an overview of the social data which underlie all of our social analyses. We had two ways of collecting social data, through interviews and through surveys. And some of you likely participated in one or both of these. Um, during the interviews, we asked land managers to describe current management objectives and current management practices. Using these land manager responses, we summarize them into 10 management objectives and 13 current management categories. During the interviews, we showed managers the future fire risk maps produced from the fire risk analysis I just described and asked them how likely it was that they would continue to meet current management in objectives in the future, as well as how likely it would be to change management practices con to continue to meet current objectives. We also asked them a question about how likely, if they were not able to change current management practices, how likely it would be to change current objectives. That piece of the interview was not used in the, the spatial analyses and uh, Claire and Sarah will actually address that later in the non-spatial analyses. Managers, in these interviews, managers were asked about both pre-selected random points across the landscape when, within their jurisdictions as well as areas of concern that the managers identified. For the surveys, we sent surveys out to land managers to ask questions about innovation and uncertainty, adaptive management, and constraints within their organization. Land managers responded for their jurisdiction. For each social model, risk, resistance, and adaptive capacity, we used both interview and survey data as an input. So this is just an overview of the survey to show you uh, examples of some of the questions, which are actually statements, um, and had managers respond on a Likert scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree. So going back to the social component of fire risk, um, for the, from the interview data, Land managers reported current management objectives and current management practices. And we used responses for any objective that fell under the category of fire suppression and any fire management practice and scored one for yes and zero for no. And these maps at the bottom are um, maps of where fire suppression is happening across the landscape on the left. Uh, fire suppression is in turquoise and on the right where fire management is occurring across the landscape and those are in blue. <clears throat> to predict the probability of fire suppression objectives or fire management in areas of the Sonoran Desert where we did not have interview responses, we used Bernoulli logistic regression and our predictor variables were jurisdiction type so federal, non-military, state, local, military, and tribal. We use distance to nearest major road, distance to community, elevation, latitude, and longitude. And all of these predictor variables came up in one way or another in interviews with the managers. From the survey side, we used two questions about organizational constraints. My organization has sufficient resources and personnel to manage fire and fuels on a day-to-day -day basis. And my organization has sufficient resources and personnel to manage fire and fuels during fire incidents. Moving on to resistance, um, and starting with ecological resistance, we created a spatial layer of ecological resistance by summing all of these indicators uh, noted on the left-hand column of this table. These indicators were chosen based on what ecological variables describe heterogeneity and complexity on the landscape scale, as well as those that correspond with longer time scales. So we use topographic diversity, geophysical diversity, vegetation diversity, water availability. Each of these were created layers and they were summed to one metric of ecological resistance. <clears throat> 
for social resistance um, from the interview, we used the question of whether or not managers believed that they were likely to meet current management objectives using current management practices. And again, to predict to jurisdictions where we had no interview responses, we used order to logistic regression using a multinomial distribution. And it's worth noting that these were across all objectives. We did not focus on any specific objective. It was whether or not they were likely to meet management objectives, whatever the objective was. The predictor variable for the logistic regression were jurisdiction type and also ecological fire risk drawn from the produced future fire risk maps. And the reason that we use this is because managers were shown this map of future fire risk before uh, they were asked these questions about whether or not they were likely to meet current management objectives. From the survey, we used the statement, in my organization, we expect and try to prepare for surprises in ecosystem behaviors. We average responses for each jurisdiction type and used the average response in jurisdictions that did not respond to the survey. Moving on to ecological adaptive capacity. Again, we created a spatial layer of ecological adaptive capacity by summing the indicators of habitat connectivity, species richness, and human modification. These indicators were chosen um, based on what ecological variables describe resources across an, a landscape and the quality of the landscape, as well as those that correspond with shorter time scales. For social adaptive capacity from the interview data, we use the question of whether or not managers uh, responded that they were likely to change current management practices to be able to meet current management objectives. We use the same analysis as for social resistance with the interview data where we used an ordered logistic regression and multinomial distribution to predict Likert responses to areas where we didn't have data across the landscape. And again, the predictor variables were jurisdiction type and fire risk. And on the survey side, uh, we use the statement, I've seen my organization successfully change management strategies when necessary. So to give you an overview of how all of this fits together, like I said, we summed the results of the ecological risk analyses, the social risk analyses to get a total socio-ecological risk. We did the same for ecological resistance and for, sorry, for total resistance. And we did the same for total socio-ecological adaptive capacity. So now I'm going to turn this over to Sarah to go over, and Claire, to go over the non-spatial analyses that we did using this, these data. Thanks, Manette. <clears throat> So in addition to the spatially explicit analyses that Minette is conducting, Claire and I wanted to mine the interview data for patterns that were not necessarily spatial in nature. So Minette has gone through a lot of this information already, but just so you know um, where this data is coming from, we randomly generated points across the landscape and then of course asked land managers to report on the objectives, activities, and likelihood of meeting those objective, ob objectives associated with those points across the landscape. As Minette men mentioned, we scored those interviews and identified 10 management objectives, and 13 management activities. So for these categorical data, for each spatial point across the landscape, we either scored it as a one if the objective or the activity was reported for that area, or zero if it wasn't. And then we were able to analyze those data using generalized linear models with a binomial error distribution, and of course followed those up with um, pairwise comparisons to test for differences among groups. Land managers reported the level of confidence that any particular activity would meet 
the objectives that it was intended to meet or could be adopted, especially if it was an activity they were not yet using. We were interested in investigating the level of confidence in these management activities to determine if there were certain patterns that might emerge relevant to jurisdiction ownership or relevant to certain characteristics of each site. Some of this involved simple summary statistics. So what were the objectives and activities and what were the confidence levels that were reported by managers related to each of these objectives and activities by jurisdiction? So we will present some of that to you today. We were also interested in comparing those confidence levels by activity and by objective. So particularly, were there certain objectives that managers felt they were more likely to be able to achieve or certain activities that they felt they were more likely to be able to adopt? We used Kruskal Wallace H tests with Dunn's tests for multiple comparisons to compare those confidence levels. And additionally, we were interested in understanding how different types of jurisdictions reported differing levels of confidence in their ability to achieve objectives. And so we use simple t-tests to compare federal versus non-federal jurisdictions in that area. At this moment, we wanted to pause for just a couple minutes to see if there are any questions or clarifications on the methods to this point before we move into the results section of the presentation. There's a chat box that hopefully everybody's been able to find. And if you do have questions, you're welcome to enter them there. Um, and we can do our best to respond. We'll move on in just a few, a few moments to the results section. All right, seeing none, we're going to move on to the results section. Of course, at the end of the results, we do have substantial time set aside for questions. I'm going to pass it back to Manette. Thank you. So before I go into results, I just want to let you know what's about to happen. I'm going to go through each of the results, each of the analysis results for ecological risk, social risk, ecological resistance, social resistance, ecological adaptive capacity, and social adaptive capacity. These are the inputs for total socio-ecological risk, resistance, and adaptive capacity. And I'm going to go through them fairly quickly. Um, if you have questions on them, feel free to stick those questions into the chat box. And as Claire said, we can get to them after we go through all of the results. All of the results that are presented are at the level of the study area. If you're interested in seeing downscaled results for your particular jurisdiction, I would encourage you to sign up for the workshop. So this map of ecological fire risk across the landscape will likely be familiar to those of you who participated in the interviews. Low ecological risk or low fire risk across the landscape is in green and high risk is in red. And at the top right of this map and in all of the following maps, um, there's a reminder of all of the pieces that went into creating uh, these results. Moving on to social risk. Um, the gray areas on this map are private lands for which we had no data. Areas of low risk are in yellow. Areas of high risk are in red. And we found that the major drivers of risk across the landscape were jurisdictions that had no fire suppression and no fire management. This is the results for ecological resistance. And low resistance are these darker turquoise colors and high resistance are the lighter turquoise colors. 
major drivers of ecological resistance were geophysical diversity and vegetation diversity. For social resistance, again, yellow areas are high social resistance, red areas are low, and major drivers of social resistance are whether managers reported that management objectives could continue to be met. There was more spread in the, this response than in surprises in ecosystem behavior, but it's worth noting that all answers for whether or not management objectives could continue to be met hovered around uncertainty, which is this I don't know category in the Likert response. Ecological adaptive capacity is low ecological adaptive capacity is shown in dark turquoise. High is shown in this, these lighter colors of turquoise. And as should be obvious for all of you who are very familiar with the Sonoran Desert landscape, a major driver of low ecological adaptive capacity are roads, proximity to roads, and proximity to human modification in general. For social adaptive capacity, again, we have yellow denoting areas of high social adaptive capacity and red denoting areas of low social adaptive capacity with these gray areas as private lands. A major driver of social adaptive capacity is whether or not an organization has changed management strategies in the past. If they have, they were, they ranked as more highly adaptive and if they had not, they ranked as uh, less adaptive. This is just a reminder that total ecological risk, resistance, and adaptive capacity are summed from the ecological and social results. I'm going to show the total maps several times to point out features of them. So if I move through them too quickly initially for you to absorb them or for your particular areas of interest on the landscape um, to be found, I'll return to them multiple times. So here's our map of total socio-ecological risk, where blue and cooler colors in general denote low risk, and red and warmer colors in general denote high risk. And as you can see, there's considerable variability across the landscape. Total resistance. High resistance is denoted in blue and cooler colors. Low resistance is denoted in red and warmer colors. And total adaptive capacity. Again, high adaptive capacity is denoted in blue or cooler colors, and low is denoted in red or warmer colors. And as you can see, this ecological piece of near to roads, near to human modification is really driving this total adaptive capacity map. So I'm gonna go through and point out a few areas of interest. I'm starting with the good news first. These are some areas of uh, low fire risk across the Sonoran Desert landscape. They are both in the western half and as an extra bonus, they have high resistance and also high adaptive capacity for the most part. Although again, if you're close to a road, you're going to have slightly lower adaptive capacity. Less good news, but not terrible. There are a few areas of very high fire risk but these same areas have also high resistance and high adaptive capacity. So despite this high fire risk, these areas are prepared ecologically and socially to be resilient to fire incidents. And now for the areas of concern. These areas have 
high fire risk, low resistance, although there is some variation across the areas where some have slightly higher or higher resistance than others, and lower adaptive capacity, again with some variation across these areas. So this is, these are areas of concern because not only is there high fire risk, we have low resistance in these areas and low adaptive capacity, meaning that these areas are not prepared ecologically or socially to remain in the same state or return to the same state when fire incidents occur. So returning to this overall model of resilience and vulnerability, I used the results from our socio-ecological uh, risk, resistance, and adaptive capacity to compare them to this framework set up by a NatureServe report on climate change vulnerability and adaptation strategies for natural communities in the Sonoran and Mojave deserts. In this, they defined these categories in the lower right of low, moderate, high, and very high vulnerability based on a zero to one index score for resilience, which is a combination between uh, indirect effects, which is our resistance, and adaptive capacity, and sensitivity, which is our risk. So here is a figure that shows sensitivity on the x-axis, resilience on the y-axis. Sensitivity moves from uh, low risk on the left to high risk on the right. Resilience moves from high resilience uh, near the zero point to low resistance at the, or sorry, low resilience at the top. And the box in the lower right reminds you how these areas are divided up into low, moderate, high, and very high vulnerability. Each point within the figure is a cell of the total resilience, resistance, and adaptive capacity combined, and total risk rasters. So as you can see, there are a few areas across the Sonoran Desert landscape that actually have low vulnerability. That's great news, but there are a lot of areas that fall into moderate vulnerability and even more areas that fall into very high or high vulnerability. And to show you where these areas occur across the landscape, um, here are maps of sensitivity or risk and resilience, which is that combined score of resistance and adaptive capacity. In this, red colors are better and yellow colors are worse. So red denotes uh, low risk and yellow denotes high risk. And red denotes high resilience and yellow denotes low resilience. Areas with very high vulnerability are yellow on both the sensitivity and the resilience maps. Areas with high vulnerability are yellow on either sensitivity or resilience and orange on the other. Areas of moderate vulnerability can either be orange on both maps or orange on the sensitivity map and red on the resilience map. And areas of low vulnerability are red on the sensitivity map and orange on the resilience map. So now I'm going to turn this over again to Sarah and Claire for the results of the non-spatial analyses. So Claire and I are now reporting on some of the results from the non-spatial analyses. 
This figure is simply showing that certain management objectives were more or less commonly identified by land managers than others. So just to orient you to the figure, these green bars indicate the proportion of total objectives reported by land managers that are comprised by these di 10 different management objectives that we um, identified. Conservation, fire suppression, recreation were the most commonly identified objectives. I also want to point out that in the top of the figures, I've given the test statistic and the associated p-value, and any um, bar that shares the same letter is not statistically different from the other bars that share the same letter. Agriculture, grazing, military activities, resource extraction, and no objective for management were the least commonly identified objectives. Now, of course, if we break this into different components for different agencies, we can see that agencies differed in their management objectives, of course. Now, this is a really complex figure, but it follows the same general structure as the preceding figure that I just showed you. I'm not going to walk you through everything, but I kind of just wanted to point out one example so that you can understand how to interpret this particular slide. So, in this case, what we've done is we've created on the y-axis the proportion of total objectives per agency comprised by each of these different management objectives. So in other words, if you'd go across and add up agriculture, conservation, cultural resource protection for the federal agencies, that should tally to one. So when we look at, say, the military, we can see that they identified four principal management objectives. Um, they have a management objective for military activities, resource extraction, conservation, and recreation. If we look at a particular objective, say, the military activities, we can see that um, the military is the only agency that specified that particular activity, and that for most of the points across their landscape, um, many of them had this military objective. We can also look at resource extraction next and see that many, it's not a very popular objective across agencies, whereas conservation and recreation are. All of the major agency classifications identified those objectives. So in other words, when you're looking at this figure, you can look not only within each agency and see how they're allocating space or how they perceive that they're allocating space to each of these different objectives, but you can look across a particular objective and compare how the different agencies are um, defining objectives for their, for their area. And then you can just go through the slide and pick out patterns that are interesting to you. So one that I chose here was just looking at how federal and tribal lands were the only agencies to identify cultural resource protection as an objective. Another thing that was interesting is that state lands were more likely to specify an agriculture or grazing objective for their particular parcels. Here we have some of the summary statistics related to the confidence with which each of our respondents reported that they were likely to achieve their current objectives. So again, these values are drawn from these Likert scales, which ranged from one to five during the interviews. Each of the interviewees reported each of these objectives, and along with it, they reported the confidence that they felt they were likely to achieve that objective. Note that level three was sort of the middling level that indicated that they were not sure. So of course, many of these confidence levels are hovering around three. There was definitely a tendency to center around three, but it is interesting to point out those objectives that seemed to have slightly more confidence in reporting or those that had slightly less. In particular, those that had objectives related to agriculture or to general fire suppression reported in general a higher likelihood of achieving those objectives into the future. By contrast, those that had cultural resource protection as one of their key objectives reported a slightly lower likelihood of achieving that objective into the future. There were different management activities um, that agencies used to meet these 
objectives, and they differed, of course, by agency. So we identified 10 different objectives. That is way too much information to present here. We'll report that in the final report. Um, but so today I'm just going to go over one objective, which is fire suppression. So just to orient you to this figure, on the y-axis we have the proportion of total management activities, and on the x-axis we have the management agency classification. So you can see that of the agencies that identified fire suppression as an objective, most of them were managing that for that objective by um, actively managing fires. Now, one of the interesting thing, patterns that we, you can note here is that the federal agencies had a slightly more diversified approach towards um, meeting this objective of fire suppression. They also included grazing in their management activities, native species management, outreach and education, and, pre and preventative vegetation removal, which refers to removing invasive species. So the federal government tended to include more preventative measurements, measures. In terms of the management activities and summarizing across the levels of confidence that were reported, here again, we have those summary statistics using those Likert scales that ranged from one to five. Each of our respondents mentioned which activities they associated with each objective and then estimated on a scale of one to five how likely those activities were to meet those objectives. Again, you can see that there's a few of them that sort of emerge, although most tend to hover once again among around that level of three or the don't know level, sort of that middling response. A few that seem worth pointing out, um, those that manage for crops, for fire management, and for native species management tended to score somewhat higher on their confidence that they would be able to um, use these activities successfully to achieve objectives. Those that manage for cultural and social resource protection, once again, as well as those that manage for recreation had slightly lower scores overall. At the same time, we asked those that reported a low confidence that they would achieve a particular objective at a particular location to identify any alternative management activities that they imagined could be adopted in that location. And once more, some of those um, emerging activities uh, were scored with fairly high likelihoods of being adopted. Those included reverting to active fire management, implementing active outreach and education, and interestingly, um, those that reported that they were unlikely to adopt any alternative management reported that that was not a very likely alternative strategy, <laughs> um, which sounds a little bit, uh, it sounds a little bit um, intuitive, but the point here, I think, is that people are not willing to give up. They're not likely to adopt nothing if the current strategy is not likely to achieve their objectives. We ran a, a brief Kruska wallace comparison to get a sense of whether objectives were more likely to be achieved than others. Although, once again, the objectives do tend to hover around that level of three or that sort of non-committal don't know, there was a high enough sample size here that we were able to pick out some interesting patterns. Economically, economic objectives are significantly more likely to be achieved than conservation, recreation, or cultural resource protection objectives across the board. Fire prevention and recreation were both significantly more achievable, according to our respondents, than conservation or cultural resource protection. And military objectives were significantly more likely to be achieved than all the others with the exception of economic objectives. In this figure, just as in the ones presented earlier, a difference in the letter on top of each column implies that there is a, diff a significant difference in confidence level um, between those columns. Applying the same test to management activities, we again compared the likelihood that certain activities would be successful in achieving their objectives. Economic activities, once more, were significantly more likely to be effective than conservation, fire prevention, recreation, or cultural resource protection activities. And both fire prevention and recreation were significantly more achievable than cultural resource protection. These are not, of course, separated out by jurisdiction type. These activities and objectives are across the board among all of our interviewees. We were also interested in how jurisdictions differed, and in particular, the finding that federal jurisdictions reported a high number of different activities led us to question whether federal jurisdictions also reported higher confidence levels that they would achieve their objectives. 
This was a very simple test, simply a t-test comparing federal and non-federal jurisdictions. Both of them, once again, hover around that mean of don't know or the non-committal mean, but there were still significant differences where federal jurisdictions report higher likelihoods of achieving objectives than do non-federal jurisdictions. And federal jurisdictions also reported higher likelihood of adopting new activities, if need be, than the non-federal jurisdictions reported. We're gonna provide just a few takeaway messages and conclusions um, stemming from these results, and then we're going to open the, the floor for questions and discussion. So I'll pass it back to Manette for a moment. I just wanted to point out again some areas of vulnerability across the landscape. There are these areas in the Western Sonoran that are either um, high risk, but also high resistance and high adaptive capacity that are less vulnerable than some of these areas in the Eastern Sonoran Desert that have both high fire risk and uh, low resistance and low adaptive capacity. Some sources of vulnerability are on the ecological side, high NDVI going back to um, Miranda Gray's model results for fire risk, low elevation, and low road density. Low geographical and vegetation diversity and proximity to human modifications like roads. If you notice, low road density leads to higher risk, but proximity to roads leads to lower adaptive capacity. So it's all bad. <laughs> Social sources of vulnerability are uh, agencies not doing fire suppression or fire management, responding that the jurisdiction is unlikely to meet objectives, and not having changed management strategies in the past. An additional social source of vulnerability is, again, this respondents were, average respondents were generally hovering around the I don't know or uncertain response about the future. And that uncertainty could lead to greater vulnerability. On the other side of this, there are a few noted sources of resilience. Low NDVI and fewer invasive species will confer greater ecological resilience, as does higher plant diversity. Adopting fire suppression as a management objective and doing active fire management uh, confers social resilience and having organizational flexibility to be able to change management objectives or change management practices to continue meeting objectives is really an important source of resilience. Obviously, all of these require having more resources. One of the survey or two of the survey questions that I used concerned resources and like many of the other responses, those hovered around a uh, lack of agreement, um, not disagreement, not agreement about whether or not any given organization had enough resources to meet fire incidents in the future. Certain management objectives that were associated with low probability of success seem to include cultural resource protection and recreation. These lower probabilities of success did cross different types of jurisdictions. They seem to be somewhat universally scoring a little bit lower than some of the other objectives. Cultural resource protection in this case often included both historical um, and prehistorical artifacts or locations of importance across the region. Alternative management activities that were identified included outreach and education, direct fire management, included remo including removal of vegetation or invasives for fire prevention, and obtaining more resources via partnerships among agencies. 
So these were management activities that people reported that they were not currently doing within their own jurisdiction, but that they could imagine doing if their current activities were not able to meet their objectives. It's interesting in this case that they, they identified this combination of activities which involved both the social or manager side as well as the ecological or direct intervention side. We have been doing some literature review on these alternative management activities and we'll be including that literature review in the final report in order to identify times and places in which each of these has been reported to be successful in arid systems worldwide. It's important then to be considering these changing conditions across the landscape in light of resource scarcity. We know that weather is becoming less predictable across the region and that invasive species are spreading. We also know that fire across the board, across the country, is becoming a bigger and bigger issue and is often not resourced at the level that it needs to be. So as man management agencies confront these resource scarcities, it becomes difficult to pinpoint where and how they should be directing those resources. We note that ecological and social factors combine to dictate their risk and their response. So there's places that ecologically simply have higher risk of fire, at least in some years, and there's places that ecologically have lower risk. There's also social responses that allow a particular location to bounce back more readily from, its, from an event like a fire or to perhaps prevent some sort of a state change as a result of a fire. The potential options to, to confront these particular changes also include both social and ecological approaches. And so taking a look at this through both lenses has allowed us to get a different view on the landscape and identify some areas where these are really intersecting to potentially influence the future. Now we're at the point of the webinar where we would like to take any questions, feedback, or comments. I want to reiterate once again that we have a workshop coming up in three weeks in Tucson, and we will be presenting these results as well as some additional refinements and downscaled um, versions of these models. We will be taking that workshop as a time to interact directly with participants to work through um, next steps to, to have a discussion about what the, the key priority next studies should be in the region and also ways in which this information can best be disseminated to be of use and of interest to stakeholders across the region. And following the workshop, we will be taking all of these results and combining them into our final report. So the information we've presented today will be available in multiple ways, but we do look forward to seeing many of you at the workshop. Um, and we want to now take a moment to see if we can hear from you on what you saw and whether you have specific questions or thoughts. And once again, the chat box should be available. Um, if you have not found it, if you scroll your mouse to the top of the window, you ought to see a menu. Um, on the far right, there's a, a button that says more with three dots and you can access the chat box through that button. So please feel free to record your questions into the chat box. All right, um, well, since we do not see questions in the chat box, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. We want to issue a strong thank you to the Southwest Fire Science Consortium for hosting this webinar. We deeply appreciate their assistance throughout this project and with this opportunity to engage with you all. We very much look forward to the workshop on June 20th. Um, each of you has heard from us multiple times about the project and the workshop, so please feel free to reach out if you have questions or concerns. Um, if you are able to attend the workshop and have not yet registered, we encourage you to do so. If you're unable to attend the workshop but are interested in continued interactions on this project, we are at that step where we are very pleased to take um, feedback and to bounce these results off of people and to get a sense of additional ways in which we can tweak these analyses. So we welcome those kinds of communications. Uh, we very much appreciate you taking the time to join us today.
And we look forward to making all of these results broadly available. Great. Thank you for a great webinar. And um, I'll go ahead and, and close it down and I'll um, send out an email when the recording is ready. Great. Thank you so much, Sander. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.